as we possibly can. Actually had a girl 
She sent me a photo just just last week, a couple of days ago. Sent me a photo. I've put it on the Savannah Lander's Facebook page. There's a Savannah Lander cup at a Lifeline shop, priced at one cent. I reckon a bloody golf lander enthusiast has been involved with that one. Yeah. So um, we'd love to see where your cups end up. Take them home, take them on your next holiday, get them involved in whatever hobby you, you do. We'd love to see where they are. If, you, if you're pretty tricky with um, social media, you know, you can, you can hashtag some Adelaide in your post on it or whatnot. Or if you want, you can just send them to me, Will, at savannahlander.com.au and I can um, take and put it up on your behalf if you want, but we'd love to see where it comes in now. to get those metals out of the ground weren't very environmentally friendly at all. And because of that, now in North Queensland, especially up on the tablelands around these mining areas, we've got a lot of extremely contaminated waterways. Creeks and rivers that you can't even look at, let alone get in and drink. We don't want to make those mistakes again. Today we've got technology that shows us we've got those minerals underneath us. But to get them out of the ground and not contaminate groundwater and destroy the environment around us, it's just not economical. They're not going to be able to do all that, get it out, and then still turn some sort of a profit. But that doesn't mean that that'll always be the case. A hundred years down the track, we might have some awesome technology that will allow us to get it out of the ground without worrying about the environment. If that is the case, as a resource reserve, it's kind of just sitting there on standby, ready to be used if that happens. In the meantime, it still kind of gets the exact same protection as a national park. Uh, they've set up a little camping area. If you were to drive that road between Forsyth and Orange, a little camping area there, you can pull up and I think there's only two camp spots few hundred metres of tracks that they've taken down to some of the canyons and the waters so you can have a look at. But it really is a pretty spectacular plot of land.
do it tomorrow morning, but I can do it now if you want. I've had like four people ask me morning tea about termites now. You're yelling out about termites. So strap yourselves in because I am going to blow your socks off with the exciting world of termites. It was a question that, you know, it came up very early on when I first started working here. Lots and lots of people asked about termites. Understand it, it's a very dominant feature of the Savannah landscape as we're cruising through. Very dominant. People had asked me questions about all sorts of animals, and I could answer those questions because at some point in my career zookeeping, I've worked with those animals, whether it was a dingo, whether it was a guano, a black tail, a uh, red tail, black rock too a wedge or whatever, I could answer those questions, but then people started asking me about termites, and I couldn't answer the questions. I'd never worked with termites in a zoo. Has anyone ever been to a zoo to see the riveting termite display? No. You guys all know Steve Irwin? Did anyone ever go to Australia Zoo when he was alive? Specifically for the midday termite feeding? Hey, Steve walks out into the crocker sand with a lump of wood, throws it on the ground, and everyone sits around for the next nine months to watch it disappear. No, it didn't bloody happen. <laughs> so there was an animal that was completely and utterly foreign to me. I didn't know. But I wanted to answer people's questions, so I reached out to some old colleagues that specialised in the study of insects, entomology. They put me on to some good papers, some good books to read. That was 12 years ago. I haven't stopped reading about termites since. They are the most fascinating creature I've ever had the privilege of learning about. And I think part of the reason that they're so fascinating is because, like most people, you don't like termites. You just think they're a pest. I mean, they get in their house, call the pest control bloke to come and spray and cost them heaps of money. Not to mention the, the damage, trying to repair all that, but heaps of money too. So it's really branded in our head that these little buggers are nothing but a pain in the butt. species. If we got rid of them overnight, so many of our plants and animals would disappear. They would not survive anymore. But we'll get to that bit in a minute. Worldwide, there's just over 3,500 different species. In Australia, we have about 10%. It's not too bad. Just over 350 different types of termites. So I get a lot of people say, oh look, the termites I'm seeing here look different to the ones I saw when I went up to Cape York, or different to the ones I saw in the Kimberleys. And yes, with 350 odd different species, they're going to look different. You know, their mounds, their nests, they're going to look different. The ones that we see most of are the plains termites, these little tiny pointy buggers that you see everywhere, the conical things. Plains is in grassy plains, and then every now and then there's a much bigger, more bulbous nest called a cathedral termite. They're the two main ones that we see. Now, another question people get all the time is, oh geez, these termites must play havoc with your wooden sleepers and the wooden parts of the bridge. Well, no, they don't. Because these termites, the plains termites and the cathedral termites, don't eat timber. That was like one of the first things I read when I was learning about termites, and I was like, what? Because that's what we know termites is doing. They eat timber, but these ones don't. Don't touch the stuff. In fact, 97% of the world's termites do not eat timber. They eat dry grass, dry leaves, and organic matter decaying in soil. They don't touch wood. Only 3% of them do. 
So if you absolutely hate turbines, it's only 3% that you don't like. The other 97%, not a drama to your year whatsoever. So these ones, Cathedral from Mains Turbines, they're eating dry grass. Now we definitely have the timber eating turbines out here. And they're pretty easy to find as well. They just don't build these external mounds like that. If you have a look outside, either side of the trunk, it doesn't take too long before you find a dead tree. Got one coming up there on the right hand side. I guarantee you, if we chopped that dead tree in half, we would find the timber eating species of termites. Right there on the right, that'd be inside that, gradually deconstructing that tree from the inside out. Now these mounds that you're looking at, they're not the individual nest. The nest extends underneath the ground, it's much larger. When you look at these mounds, try and picture a uh, an iceberg, you know, it's just a little bit sticks above the surface, underneath the ground is a much bigger nest. And how big is that nest really depends on how old the queen termite is and how many daughters she has in her colony. A queen termite is one of the most longest living insects on the face of the planet. It can live till she's somewhere between 30 and 50 years old. It's a long time for an insect. Not only that, but on average, she gives birth to one egg every three seconds. 30,000 eggs a day. You ladies reckon you got it tough giving birth to one baby in nine months. 30,000 eggs a day. You're gonna be walking bow like and something fierce. So if she's a young queen, she's only a year old, she might have a few thousand workers in a colony, but it's going to be fairly small. If she's 32 years old, she might have millions. Her nest under the ground is going to be quite substantial. And she might ju not just have one mound above the surface, she might have three, four, maybe six. And what these mounds do is they're all thermoregulating towers for the nest under the ground. These mounds have a genius way without having to change shape, orientation, location, size, anything. They channel cool and warm air down into the nest under the ground, depending on what the above air temperature is doing. So that nest under the ground never gets below about 25 degrees Celsius, never gets above 30, 31. Just sits in a nice little five, six degree stable kind of bracket. Perfect for the turbines. Now that nest under the ground and these mounds you see obviously inside, pitch black. Termites do not like light. Insects have an exoskeleton and that is there to help protect them from heating up and drying out. Termites exoskeletons is a very, very thin. And if anything happens to that mound and the sunlight gets in there, it starts heating them up and drying them out very, very quickly. So they keep it jet black inside and they keep it very, very humid. And keeping it humid in the dry season is extremely difficult. What the termites will do is they'll tunnel down deep into the ground and they'll find the water table. Inside their mouth, they've got a bladder. We call it a water sack. They're the only insect on the planet to have it. They draw up moisture into this, this bladder. They go all the way back up to the surface of their mound and they walk around the place vomiting on the walls, the ceiling and the floor. Raising the humidity inside that nest. They keep doing it because in the dry season it keeps drying out. So they've got to keep doing it, keep doing it. Over in the Kimberleys we've got the deepest tunneling termites in the world. They'll tunnel 80 metres down to the water table to take moisture back up to the nest. 80 metres, when you consider the size of a termite, they are the deepest tunneling animals on the planet. They build deeper tunnels than we do. Keep drawing out those nests, and all we've actually found 
There's a, one of the big reasons those nests keep drying out is because all the roots from the grasses, the plants, the trees, the shrubs, are all tapping in to that humidity in that nest and they are drawing the humidity in. That bit of moisture that the termites are constantly bringing up to the surface is keeping all of these plants alive until the wet season turns up. They did a study in Western Australia. They looked at uh, wheat plantations. Wheat plantations that have termite nests active in them produce 30% more wheat in the dry season in comparison to wheat plantations that didn't have any termites because the farmer had sprayed business.
here, find them in the snowy country, find them in the wet tropical rainforest like to Cape York, Alice Springs, the Pilbara, southwest corner, they're everywhere. Extremely iconic, lovely little lake. Did you guys know numbats? There's another one, pretty endangered, beautiful little Aussie native, termite specialist. Do you know blind snakes? Not enough people know about blind snakes. There's like 70 species of blind snakes. They are a snake. And you've probably got them in your yard. In fact, I almost guarantee that you've got them in your yard. They live under the ground. You may have seen them and totally thought it was a worm. They look like a worm, but if you pick it up and have a really close look, you'll see they've got two... They're not always. for a second. That's terrifying, isn't it? Imagine there's something in your house. It is eating your children whole and you can't see the bloody thing. Scary. So, we've got our specialists, but then we've got our generalists. Other wildlife that lead a whole range of other things are will eat termites when given the opportunity. See, in a week or two's time, the heat and the humidity is going to continue to crank and that's when termites get ready to breed. Kings and queens fitted with wings will come to the tops of these little mounds. They'll take flight up into the sky, fill the sky up with their billions. The whole idea is to mate, to land on the ground, and then the pair move underneath the rock or underneath the log and they start their colony. But very few of them get there. They're flying around in the air getting smashed by birds. Insectivorous birds like willy wagtails tails and wrens rainbow beaters, peewees, butcher birds and magpies, they all take advantage of this situation. But not just those insect eating birds, go back to the Gouldy and Finch we just spoke about, the seed eater will gorge itself on termites when it can to put on extra condition and get ready to breed. A lot of captive finch breeders in Australia will offer their finches termites when they get ready to breed. But the sun goes down and then the night shift comes out. Microbats flying around at night, eating as many termites as they get a hold of. Microbat can eat like four times its own weight in termites in a night. That's the equivalent to me eating 600 kilograms of chicken breast tonight for dinner. Could you imagine that? Imagine me passing it out the next day, that tool is not going to cope. That's a ridiculous amount of termites. Old Palestine here on the left hand side. Let's go past it slowly if you want to get a photo of that. Derailed off the track in the 90s and just been sitting there ever since. Now, if you're a termite king and queen that manages to escape the uh, the onslaught in the sky, let's say you come down to land on the ground, but you miss the ground, you landed on the surface of the water in a river or a creek. Archer fish, rainbow fish, little <laughs> grunner, bar grunner, long tom. They're all eating you. All these fish love eating you. But maybe you were lucky enough to miss that and you did land on the ground. Or you just got eaten by a gecko or a frog or a skink or a small dragon all the way up to your bigger dragons like frill neck dragons and 
negative dragons. But if one of them didn't get you, maybe an insect did, like an ant. Ants love eating turtles. Or an assassin bug. Or maybe an invertebrate like a spider. Or a scorpion. Perhaps you managed to dodge all them. Now you've got to worry about the Dazzy Urids. Dazzy Urids are carnivorous marsupials. So little mammals that have pouches and have sharp teeth that eat lizards, spiders, crickets, hell of a lot of termites. Bilbies are uh, numbats. Dunnarts, Antichinus, Planigales, Fasigals, Mulgaras, Kawaris. These animals you've probably never even heard of. But they're little furry critters that come out at night time eat as many termites as they can. So termites are an incredibly important food source for a lot of our native animals. But not just food, they're extremely important when it comes to the reproductive cycle of a lot of our native wildlife as well. You guys know, um, you know the name Australia? You know that wasn't first off the bat? Like, they gave us a few other names first. Have you ever heard of New Holland? There was a name, didn't stick very much. Have you ever heard of Terracitacorum? It's not one that many people know about, but for a while we were known as Terracitacorum. Land of the parrots. We've got 55 parrot species in Australia, and each and every one of them pretty much needs to have to reproduce. We know parrots breed in hollows, tree hollows. How is a tree hollow made? Timber-eating turbines. They ate out the hardwood after the tree died, creating that perfect nesting habitat for red-tailed black cockatoos and major mitchells, sulfur crescent cockies and gorillas and galahs and red-winged parrots and budrigars. You name it, all those parrots use those hollows to breed in. So do Gouldian finches. So do owls. So do sugar gliders and possums and quolls. There's a lot of animals that need those hollows to reproduce and raise their kids. We've got a very endangered species of parrot called a golden-shouldered parrot. Once upon a time was found through this area. The last one was seen near Forsyth in the early 90s. Today they're restricted to parts of Cape York. The golden shoulder parrot, the female and the male, they pick one of the cathedral turbine mounds, the bigger, more bulbous ones. They fly to the top of it, they chew out a hole in the termite mound itself. They lay their eggs in there and raise their kids in that. But they're not the only one to do that. One of their most iconic birds, kookaburra. And his rallies, the kingfishers. They will breed in termite mounds. Have you guys ever seen the arboreal termite mounds, the ones up in the forks of trees? I'll try and find one for you, I'll keep an eye on it. When I was working in zoos, obviously we had gardens through the zoos and big trees, and we'd get them up in the fork of a tree. And for whatever reason, American tourists, fascinated. Excuse me, sir, can you please tell me what that big round ball on the fork of the tree up there is? I used to muck with them a little bit, and I used to tell them that it was a koala that got caught in a bushfire. What? I mean, yeah, because they eat nothing but eucalyptus, the oil content in the koala is very fine. So, as the flames start to lick the bottom of the koala, it gets to a certain temperature, and before you know it, it just fuses into a big barbecue ball of menthol meat. Oh my god, that is horrifying. It is horrifying. Here's a tin. Would you like to donate money to save a Chipping away at them, creating a little hole, 
They get inside there, lay their eggs, hatch their chicks and raise their young. But they're not the only ones that do that. Our lace monitors, our goannas, the females in labour, heavily pregnant, will crawl up a tree, get to that arboreal termite mound, dig a hole with their back legs in it. Termites come out, they attach themselves to her, they are squirting acid at her, trying to get rid of her. She just puts up with it. She lays her eggs inside the termite mound and then runs off as quick as she can, get the bloody termites on. She doesn't even fill the nest back in. She knows that tens of thousands of termites now work tirelessly. Fill that nest in, seal those eggs inside, where they are protected from the sun, protected from predators. They're kept in a lovely, stable temperature with a nice high humidity. And the termites even tender the eggs. If any bacteria or mold or fungus, anything like that grows on the shelves of those eggs, termites clean it off. They think they're part of the nest and they look after it. So incredibly important for the plant and the animal kingdom. But people as well, the urban people of this area that we're moving through, indigenous people through a lot of Australia, had thousands of uses for termites. And one of the most well-known pieces of indigenous culture involving termites is the didgeridoo. Known all over the world. Followed out by two breeding species of termite, the indigenous people knock on the tip of the rock, listening to the hollow sound inside, and that would tell them whether it was ready to go, too far gone, or maybe needed another fortnight. But if everything was good, chop it out, clean the nest out from the inside, strip the bark back, paint it up, and use the cultural ceremonies for tens of thousands of years. One bit of info that was passed to me, by an elder in Crooktown was the uh, use of termites as a bush medicine. You imagine living out here before European settlement, especially this time of year. Water is not a plentiful commodity. You know, you've got to, you really got to uh, conserve as much moisture as possible. But let's say you ate something and it's upset your tummy. You have got diarrhea. You have got the squirt sun fears. We've all had diarrhea before. Don't pretend to have it. It's not fun. But you just get your partner to pop down to the chemist to get some gastro stop and some hydrolyte and have a day or two lying in bed. You'll be okay. But out here, getting diarrhea was almost certain death. The amount of moisture that is leaving your body, there's no way you keep your fluids up. Not at this time of year. So the first thing the indigenous people would do, the sign of a crook tummy, bite the top of the termite mound, chew it up and swallow it. Now I've got no idea if it works or not, but I have vowed to do the experiment. Next time I'm out here and I've got diarrhea, I'm going to do it. I'm going to film the whole thing. I'll put it on the Savannah Landers Facebook page, all in the name of science and research. Now, I've got no doubt that it's going to work. In fact, I bet you any money that after I do it, I'm not going to make a bowel movement for the next fortnight. You have a belly full of termite now, you're going to be pretty blocked up, but at least it stopped you from dying. And the indigenous people had thousands of more uses for it. But fast forward to European settlement, even they had uses for it. They get these little mounds, put them in a wheelbarrow, break them up with a hammer, Put a bit of water in there, mix it up into a slurry, and that was cement. That was used as flooring in the slab huts and homesteads. It was used as cricket pitches, tennis courts. Over in Georgetown, there's a heritage listed house made out of clay bricks, all fashioned to the turbine hands. Had a passenger come up once and he said, oh mate, got another use for him. So what was that? His dad was a tobacco farmer, and when he was a young fella, he said his dad would send him up trees to get those arboreal turbine bounds out. They're made of a woody, pulpy substance. He'd have to bring them down, crush them up a bit, and sprinkle them on the paddock before they planted the tobacco seeds. Once he's sprinkled it all over there, he'd set it on fire in this really low, slow flame, cruise across the paddock, burning up the seeds of competing grasses and weeds, but also a nematode that lives in the surface level of the soil that would attack the tobacco roots. 
So by the time it was done, it was sterile. He was sprinkling the back out. Oof, all right, wait for that. Another one come up. He's like, oh, mate, I've got to tell my story for you. He's like, they saved my father's life. I was like, hey. Eh? And this is part of the reason why this bloke was on the trip. Back in the 50s, he lived in Forsyth with his parents. His dad, one weekend, decided with a mate to go outside of Forsyth and go prospecting. And they never came back. Search parties went out, they couldn't find them. After about three or four weeks, his boats were proclaimed dead. They had a memorial service for him in Forsyth. This passage said it was very sad. He thought he lost his dad. Like nine days after that, these blokes were rescued. Skin and bone. But uh, they went on to make full recoveries, and obviously everyone wanted to know how did you survive in that country at that time of year. Termites, they were knocking the tops off the mounds, shaking as many as they could into their mouth. Chew them up, and that was their main source of protein and moisture. <laughs> we could keep going, but we're not too far away from lunch. The point that I'm trying to make is how cool is that animal? And we've got the nerve to call it a pest. I know that we don't want them in their house, the ones that eat the temple, we don't. But I don't think we should call them a pest. I'd much rather use that word for things like cats. <laughs> cats and ship rats, cane toads, rabbits, foxes, camels, buffalo, feral goats, like animals that have been brought in from overseas that have no place in the old native ecology. Whether that animal's in your backyard or whether that animal's out here in the bush, it is having a negative impact on the native things around it. Termites, I don't think they deserve that, that green. Yes, they're an inconvenience in our house. But out here, they are the keystone species. They are one of the very few animals that is helping to hold all this together. I think they need to be rebranded. I don't know who the marketing manager is for termites, but they're doing a really bad job at it. Do you guys know worms, like earthworms? Do you, do you guys like earthworms? Everyone does that. Some people like earthworms to the point that they have a worm farm. We know that worms are really important for our soil, and if you've got worms in your soil, that's, that's excellent. Good fertilizer, they aerate it, help uh, water to penetrate it. We used to think worms were pests, when I say we, the human race. The word worm even comes from the word vermin. We hated them, and we used to do things to try and get rid of them in our yards. It wasn't until Charles Darwin published his last book before he died that he rebranded worms. He told everyone how important they were for working the soil. And people looked at that and they went, oh, maybe we should keep these little things around. Today, we love earthworms. They're excellent. We've got to do the same thing with termites. Earthworms and termites live on the coast. They live in the rainforest country. Both of them are working hand in hand to do what they do to help the soil, to help look after the ceramic ecology. They did an experiment where they took every single animal that lives in the rainforest, everything from butterflies to cassowaries to worms and termites, and they put them all on a set of scales. Worms made up 15% of the total weight of all those organisms. Termites made up another 15%. So just worms and termites, 30% of the total weight of everything that lives in the rainforest. As we move west from the rainforest, we come into this savanna country, it is dry. We don't have worms out here. But something must be working the soil. If it's termites, then technically there should be twice as many termites out here as there is in the rainforest. They repeated the experiment out here in the savanna country and they were bang on. Termites out here make up 30% alone of the total body weight of all the animals that live through the savanna. They are picking up where the worms left off. 
So try and think of them all in that, dude. Really good for the sore level. A little white worm that has legs. Now, before we wind it up, I've got one more little bit of trivia about termites for you because I'm looking in the mirror and I'm seeing all your faces and you're like, we'll give us more. We haven't had enough. We want more termite statistics. Have you ever heard anyone call termites white ants? Or maybe you looked out the window and you said, look at the ant hills. For a very long time, we thought termites were ants. They're small, they're social, they're insects. We grouped them with ants. Same group as uh, bees and wasps. Ants, bees and wasps, termites all together. But over the last few years, our genetic technology has gotten really good. We can look at the genetics of plants and animals, and genetics do not lie. They are telling us who is related to who. Turns out we got a lot wrong. Turns out that termites and ants don't have anything in common. They've got about as much in common as a termite and a butterfly. We had to take termites away from ants. We didn't know where to put them for a little while until we found genetically where they belong. They belong with the cockroaches. People say, ugh, when they come to cockroaches, I get it. But the cockroaches you don't like, once again, introduced from America and Germany. Australia has native cockroaches that do not spread disease, don't live in your house. They live out here and they eat decomposing leaves, native fruits and veggies. They live a pretty cool little life. A lot of them are very beautiful. So it turns out the termites are a cockroach. There's a whole bunch of different criteria that links them. One big one is that they both got two body parts. Ants, bees and wasps have a head, a thorax and an abdomen, but cockroaches and termites have just heads and abdomens. The bigger one is their digestive tract. Cockroaches and termites have almost identical digestive tract and they have a microorganism very similar to one another that lives inside them. And that microorganism allows them to digest cellulose. Cellulose is an energy that is found in timber, bark, grass, leaves, fruits, veggies. Very few animals on the planet can digest it. Cows can, because they've got four parts of their stomach. They eat grass, they digest the cellulose, they benefit from that energy. We eat the cow, we benefit from that energy. Termites and roaches are doing the same thing out here. Eating the bark, the timber, the grass, the fruits, the berries. Digesting the cellulose, benefiting from that. The animals that eat them benefit from that. So on and so forth, don't have to tell you how the food chain works. But that's how we're supposed to think of termites these days, as social cockroaches. So instead of saying you've got bloody white ants in your house, you've got white roaches. It's more accurate. Or you look out the window and go, look at all the roach hills. That's more accurate once again. But they really are a very cool little animal. Now, if you've got any other questions about termites, there is something wrong with you. You don't need to know anything else, but if you do, I've got lots more termite information. Come on up and ask, and maybe to, to answer it for you. But they are very, very cool little animal. And having said that, we're off the Newcastle range. We don't have too much ground to cover at all. Pretty soon we're going to be pulling up and orange wheat, ready for a bit of lunch. How you going, Arlo? Good. What is that? Tabitha. Do you know, at home, I have a pet spider called Tabitha? Yeah. and stuff. 
have um, permission to place them at zoos and certain educational facilities or whatever. Uh, others will not be suitable for that, so they just stay with us long term. Bye.
But the other one is to head down and see the Copperfield Gorge. Now it is spectacular. It's stunning. But it's hot. It's a uh, 300,000 year old lava flow. You walk out onto the solid basalt. This time it's like walking out onto a frying pan. Four hundred meters walk. 